Instruments Advanced Practitioner um, Distance Learning Event. We're very pleased to have you for our monthly event, and we're very excited because we are joined by Ryan Segrist and Deb Bourteau from our Presidential Nominee Branch. Uh, Deb has a special message for those of you who participate in the Nominee Financial Disclosure Program. Go ahead, Deb. Thank you, Patrick. Uh, although I'm not involved... Sorry. Although I'm not involved in the training today, I know a number of you work on nominee financial disclosure reports, and I wanted to take this opportunity to thank every, everyone for their hard work on nominee financial disclosure reports. Uh, I want to turn it back over to Patrick, who's going to talk to you about some less common financial instruments and the increasingly uh, more common managed accounts. Yes. Thank you. Great. Uh, tip, uh, and thank all of you for uh, joining us today and for your participation in making our public financial disclosure system uh, a success. Um, today we are going to be talking about some less common financial instruments in preparation for our annual 278 filing. Um, if you are a 278 filer, this should be very useful and timely information as the deadline is next May, uh, next month, uh, May 15th. If you're a confidential filer, this information will be equally useful to you um, because the conflicts analysis for uh, assets reported on a 450 versus a 278 is identical. Before we get into the substance and the news from the uh, from OG's Institute for Ethics and Government, I'd like to cover uh, a few items about our new format. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank all of you for your patience um, with our formatting changes for these distance learning events. So those of you who have been attending a long time know we used to use a commercial um, a commercially available web conferencing application. Uh, that was of some success. It was uh, rather costly for OGE, and also we found a number of agency security configurations didn't allow them to participate in those meetings. Uh, likewise, we have a number of you on the phone, and we have been doing telephone calls for some time. That is more cost effective, uh, but still requires us to limit access uh, to no more than 100 folks per event per month, and I understand there was lots of frustration around that. Uh, currently, we're using these live broadcasts in addition to the phone line, and hopefully that's providing uh, as much access as we possibly can. With more than 100 agencies, we realize that that's you know, more than 100 security configurations, more than 100 uh, networks, and it's very difficult to find a solution that's accessible to everyone. So we do appreciate your patience while we try and find the best solution uh, for making our training available to all of you. Um, in the meantime, if you have difficulties accessing, uh, accessing today's broadcast or other broadcasts, you may ask your uh, CIO or someone from your IT shop if you can be granted access. Sometimes presentations are blocked for bandwidth reasons rather than security, and you may, if you show a compelling business need, be able to be granted access to these broadcasts. Uh, we did provide you today two links, so if the Google link isn't working properly for you, uh, you can also try watching the broadcast on the OGE Institute for Ethics and Government YouTube channel. Um, again, I'd like to welcome you all, and I'd also like to welcome Ryan Segrist, who's my co-presenter today, who has a few news items. Thanks, Patrick. I just have a couple of news items for all of you out there. Uh, the first one is uh, just another reminder that the 278 uh, filing deadline for public financial disclosure reports is May 15th. It's coming up quick. Uh, hopefully, uh, hopefully your filers have been working with you uh, to get those reports in uh, as, as close to the deadline as possible. And also next month, uh, for the Advanced Practitioner Series, we're going to continue today's discussion of less common financial instruments and talk about a few other ones. So with that, uh, let's go ahead and get started. And the first, uh, the first item that I need to talk about is a disclaimer. Uh, as uh, you're probably familiar with some of the, these disclaimers that are on uh, our other financial disclosure guides, uh, just remember that this presentation is not intended to provide investment advice, and you should not rely on any statements in this presentation when making investment decisions. Not that we believe you are confused about that, but we want to make clear to anyone watching who's not familiar with the Office of Government Ethics that that's not what we do here. Okay, and so let's go through the agenda real quick. Uh, I'm going to talk about a few different resources that are available that, that uh, are for, uh, for public financial disclosure reviewers, but also uh, particularly ones that are related to some of these less common financial instruments that, that we're going to talk about today. And then uh, we're, going to, we're going to talk about American depositor, depository receipts, managed accounts, phantom stock, and, and at the end, we'll have some time for questions. 
I'd just like to put our agenda today in a little bit of context. Next month for our advanced practitioner events, uh, we hope uh, that we can provide you some more information about some other less common financial instruments. Uh, we thought that this was about the right amount of content for an afternoon's presentation, and we will be building upon that in future events. Uh, so if uh, uh, an item that you're particularly interested in doesn't appear on today's agenda, it's very likely that it'll appear on a future agenda. And if you feel very strongly about it, let us know, because we will be happy to include it if there's sufficient interest. So the first, uh, the first resource that I'd like to talk about is probably the most important one. Uh, and this is the OGE's Guide to Reporting Selected Financial Instruments. Uh, there, are, there are an awful lot of complicated uh, uh, financial instruments that you can find not only the disclosure requirements, but also uh, how to do the conflicts analysis and also good explanations for what those things are and how they work. So this is actually a very important guide to have and you can download it on OGE's website and it's, it's, it, it is an important tool to have in your financial disclosure repertoire. And on the next slide we also provided some links to uh, some other resources that are there. You can also find a list of these resources on the MAX registration page and if you've not already done so I'd encourage you to bookmark those resources. So I'm going to turn it over to Patrick and Patrick, would you like to talk about American depository receipts? I would love to talk about American depository receipts. Um, before we begin getting into the substance of the American depository receipts, uh, I, I'd like to sort of suggest why we are beginning with this particular asset. The reason we're looking at ADRs is because these are probably one of the most common, less common financial assets that you'll see reported on financial disclosure reports. Uh, if you do this for any amount of time, it's very likely that you'll run into an ADR. Uh, ADRs are important for us to understand because there are some nuances that can affect our conflicts of interest analysis. It's not particularly complex or very much different than a regular stock uh, analysis, but there are some nuances that are important to know uh, so that you're not surprised by, uh, by them. So with most financial instruments, one of the problems that I often find is that I, I don't know what they are. Uh, you encounter something and the first question that comes to mind is, well, what is this thing? What are we talking about? Um, you know, how am I supposed to understand and analyze this for conflicts of interest if I don't even know what it is? Uh, so let's think about what an American depository receipt is. Uh, here we have a map of the world, uh, and an American depository receipt is a tool that allows an investor in the United States uh, to purchase an equity interest in a company that's traded on a foreign exchange uh, without the cost associated with an international stock transaction. Uh, so another way to say that is an American depository receipt allows an American investor to uh, purchase um, to purchase a right to the performance of a share that's traded on a foreign exchange. Uh, so let's think about how this might work. So imagine that I'm an investor, say, in New York, uh, and I would like to purchase shares in a stock that's traded on the London Exchange. Um, there may be some cost associated if I was to make that purchase directly, so I go to my broker and I ask if I can purchase an American depository receipt. And the American depository receipt is a financial instrument that entitles me to the performance of the share trading on the London Exchange without the expense of actually having to purchase the shares. Uh, so this produces uh, a lot of efficiencies with companies that want international exposure to equity markets. Uh, so why is this important for us as ethics officials? Uh, well, the reason it's important is because American depository receipts come in two flavors. So let's take a look at two different American depository receipts and see how our conflicts analysis differs between the two. On your screen, or on the slide, you can see uh, that we have reported BP PLC ADR. Uh, so that's the company formerly British Petroleum, now just BP. Um, and we also have the Beijing Capital Unsponsored ADR. And we have some information provided about those. Uh, so while these are both American depository receipts, there's going to be a significant difference uh, in our financial conflicts of interest analysis between the two. And there's going to be some information we need in order to make that analysis complete. So let's begin by taking a look at BP PLC ADR. On your screen, you should see uh, a quote from BP PLC ADR, I believe this was provided by Google. Uh, you can use any of the financial research tools that uh, you prefer. They'll provide you similar information. Uh, but when we look at the quote, there are a couple of things that I'd like to draw your attention to. 
In the top left, we have BPPLC, and then parenthetically, it's indicated that this is an ADR, or an American Depository Receipt. Uh, that's important information to have, and it's information that should be disclosed on the Public Financial Disclosure Report, or also on the OGE Form 450, if appropriate. Uh, then we have some other very important information. Next to ADR, it says in parentheses, NYSE, semicolon, BP. And this is significant to us uh, because it affects our financial uh, conflicts of interest analysis. The NYSE stands for New York Stock Exchange, and BP is the ticker symbol uh, of the ADR trading on that exchange. Uh, can you think of a reason why it's important for us to know that a stock or other uh, asset is traded on an exchange in the United States? If you were thinking the reason this is important is because we are uh, interested in that fact when we look at our exemptions at 5 CFR 2640 for publicly traded securities. We have some de minimis exemptions for financial interests arising from ownership of publicly traded securities. The fact that BP is traded on an exchange is going to help us determine whether or not it qualifies as a publicly traded security for purposes of those exemptions. Let's contrast BP with Beijing Capital. Beijing Capital, here's another quote from a different uh, research, uh, research service. Uh, they all provide very similar information. But there are a couple of things in this quote that I'd like to draw your attention to. Uh, so here it says, Beijing Capital unsponsored ADR. And that's important information for us to have. Uh, we have some further information. Uh, we have a ticker symbol, BJCHY semicolon OTCUS. Do you have any idea what the, the letters OTC stand for? If you were thinking over the counter, uh, you would be correct. The Beijing Capital unsponsored ADRs trade, quote unquote, under the counter in the United over the counter in the United States. Another way of saying this is on the pink sheets. That means that these uh, securities, the unsponsored American depository receipts, are not traded on an exchange. Uh, they are traded over the counter or on the pink sheets. Hey Patrick, what, how do we how do we denote that they are because over the counter is one way of doing it. What's another way of telling that they're traded over the counter on the pink sheets? Yeah, sometimes you will see in the ticker symbol five letters followed by the letters PNK. PNK indicates again that we are trading these on the pink sheets, and therefore they're not traded on the exchange. That's a very good question. So if you see those two things, be it on an ADR or even on another security. Uh, you will know that it's not listed on the New York Stock Exchange or another exchange in the United States. Let's take a look at why that is important for us. So here we have a definition of publicly traded security. And this is a, a important for us because we have uh, de minimis exemptions for financial interests arising from ownership of publicly traded securities. So if we are to rely on the exemptions, it is important for us to know whether or not uh, it applies and the first question we need to ask is whether or not the security we're discussing is publicly traded. Um, so here we have a definition, publicly traded security. And we have some criteria. The first is that it has to be registered with the SEC and listed on a national or regional securities exchange or traded through the NASDAQ. Uh, so the fact that we know that BP trades on the New York Stock Exchange tells us that it is probably a publicly traded security. And indeed, the BP uh, ADR is a publicly traded security and the exemptions are available for a holding like BP. Knowing that a uh, security like the Beijing Capital is traded over the counter or on the pink sheets tells us that it's not listed on a national or regional securities exchange and is probably not registered for the SEC. In any case, that's going to tell us that it does not qualify as a publicly traded security. Uh, so this means the de minimis thresholds are not available to us. Uh, if BP posed a conflict of interest for an employee reporting it, uh, we would not have any de minimis exemption for publicly traded securities to rely upon. So the size of the holding uh, would not be important to our conflicts analysis. Uh, so this is really the one nuance with the American depository receipts, and it's a very important one. Um, you know, if we were to miss that, we could inadvertently rely uh, incorrectly on a de minimis exemption. So you want to make sure that you are very clear about whether or not the American depository receipt is traded on exchange and therefore publicly traded, or if it's traded over the counter or on the pink sheets, meaning that it's not publicly traded and therefore the de minimis is not available. For those of you who are following along in your regs, if you want to want more information about the the exemptions for interest in securities, you can find that at 5 CFR 2640.202. Oh, thanks, Ryan.
Sure. Would you like to take us through uh, the increasingly common and ever-vexing managed account? I will be happy to take us through the, the increasingly common and ever more vexing managed account. So here's a little bit of history first to kind of explain where these things came from. Uh, before, before the managed accounts that we often see, the ones that are becoming uh, more common on financial disclosure reports, uh, brokers used to, used to be doing business for a select number of clients. It would, it would be a very limited number of clients, particularly if we're talking about people who are very wealthy and have large portfolios. And a number of years ago, uh, the uh, investment brokers realized that they could expand their business an awful lot and make it available to people who did not have, who were not necessarily wealthy, but did have some money to invest by doing by doing the same kind of management of an account, but doing it in bulk. So basically, batch managing of of uh, many people's uh, investments. Such that they are, so so such that they are uh, all kind of the same. So what does this look like, Ryan? I've I've seen some of these new sometimes see names like portfolio that indicate it's a managed account, and you can read something that looks like a prospectus that you'd find for a mutual fund. Uh, but are you saying that these are actually individual accounts that are managed by a fund manager for many many clients in similar ways? That's exactly right, and that's actually one of the things that make these very tricky. Uh, as you mentioned, ever vexing. Uh, the, the reason why they're tricky is because they do look like mutual funds. Uh, what, For example, I, I have seen a Fidelity balanced portfolio, which looks like a mutual fund that Fidelity has, but it's not. It's a, it's a managed account. So let me talk about real quick uh, what a mutual fund is, just to contrast it with what a managed account is. Uh, you may remember that a mutual fund is an investment company that buys lots and lots of different uh, investments and will pool these investments and then it will sell shares of that pool. So if you're buying shares of a mutual fund, you don't actually own any of the underlying assets that are in the, the, the pool and that's because the investment company does and you also, unless you're the fund manager, don't have any control over what actually goes in and out of that investment pool. A managed account is different because it's an individual account the person who holds the account actually owns all of the underlying securities that are in it. And the other thing is because it's an individual account, there is some, uh, some degree of control that the account holder has over it. Uh, <clears throat> so even though you have, uh, even though you have a, a broker doing uh, a batch management of many people's accounts in a way that, that, that is efficient and reduces costs, uh, there is still some, some choices that uh, filers can make when they do uh, invest in these kind of accounts. So on the next slide, let's go ahead and talk about uh, talk about some disclosure for this. Um, real quick, just take a look at what we've got here on the slide and ask yourself, do I think that this managed account is correctly disclosed? And the answer to that is no. You can also notice that the EIF box, sorry, the accepted investment fund box is checked. But the thing is, is managed accounts are not accepted investment funds. It's a common misconception by both filers and reviewers. So let's talk briefly about why this is not an accepted investment fund. You may remember that an accepted investment fund is independently managed, it's widely held, and it's publicly traded or available, or it's widely diversified. Managed accounts are not independently managed to begin with because the account holder has, exercises some degree of control over what investment strategy th th that they're going to use or what portfolio within an investment strategy that they're going to use. And some, some managed accounts even allow a little bit of leeway in terms of what goes into that portfolio. The other thing is that they're not widely held. You have an individual account holder. So it doesn't meet the accepted investment fund test, and it's that's going to affect the disclosure rules for it. So let's go ahead and look on the next slide, where we can see that see one that has been properly reported. Because of how the managed accounts are structured, we need to have a breakout of the underlying assets that are in that are in the account. Again, they're not accepted investment funds. And you may remember that we have to continue breaking out the fund until we reach individual assets 
or we reach uh, in accepted investment funds. Now, one thing to remember for the disclosure side of it is that the, uh, the transactions for all of those underlying assets are going to be required for both Schedule B, Part 1, and also for your periodic transaction reports. Now, let's briefly talk about the conflicts analysis for these. Uh, remember that uh, we, would, we will need to examine each and every underlying asset for conflicts of interest. And the thing that, that, that is uh, kind of lousy for people who have these things who have to file a financial disclosure report is that oftentimes the, the fund manager, or I'm sorry, not the fund manager, the investment broker, uh, will not agree to making sort of surgical spot changes within a portfolio because they do these things in bulk. And oftentimes filers will have to get rid of the entire managed account uh, just, to, just to be able to perform their duties without conflicts. Let me see if I understood your last point there uh, properly, Seagrist. Uh, so you're saying sometimes when you're conducting a review of a financial disclosure report, and within a managed account, you identify an asset that's potentially conflicting. Uh, sometimes the account managers are not willing to keep a filer um, out of a, a business sector that's potentially conflicting, and the filer maybe has to uh, divest him or herself of the entire account. That that is correct. That is correct, and it's not it's not sometimes. It's often. Often, because remember that the brokers are doing these things in bulk in, in order to realize efficiencies and pay fewer fees, and having that sort of individual care for a particular account is not efficient for them. Uh, so that's the vexing part. Yes, that is the vexing part. <laughs> so, uh, Patrick, would you like to uh, start talking about some phantom stock? I would love to talk about some phantom stock. And uh, no, phantom stock uh, are not shares that have dressed up for Halloween. Uh, <laughs> phantom, st <laughs> phantom stock is, uh, is an interesting arrangement that uh, you will not see with great frequency, and where you see it, uh, you often to see it on a new entrant uh, public financial disclosure report, uh, or disclosed by a spouse who has a job in the private sector. And phantom stock is basically a contract between an employer and an employee that grants the employee the right to receive a payment based on the value of the employer's stock. Uh, so what does that mean? Uh, basically, it's, uh, it's an incentive package that entitles the employee to receive a payment at some future date or dates. Uh, that corresponds to the value of the company stock. So you could think of this like incentive stock options, except in the case of options, the employee actually has to buy something or exercise them. Uh, you could think of this like incentive stock, but the phantom stock doesn't actually create an ownership interest in the company. Uh, it's a uh, right to a payment in the future. So this is distinguishable from some other forms of compensation that you'll see in executive packages of folks who are coming into the government. Usually the time of the vesting and the payout uh, is at the termination of employment, uh, after some year's duration, uh, or some other milestone is reached. Uh, so these are kind of interesting, and again, they're going to pose some interesting questions for us when it comes to conflicts of interest analysis. Um, there are going to be some important nuances and distinctions that will distinguish these from ownership uh, in regular equity, such as a publicly traded stock. Uh, so let's take a look at how that might work. So how do we disclose the phantom stock? There are going to be some interesting distinctions between phantom stock and regular equity uh, when a filer is reporting. Uh, and there's also going to be a different set of requirements when the filer's spouse is reporting phantom shares. So of course we're going to have to indicate on Schedule A uh, that the filer holds uh, phantom shares. That would be the name of the company of phantom stock. If there is any present value, uh, that would be based on the current share price of the company, we could indicate the category if any payments have been received during the reporting period, that should also be disclosed on Schedule A. If the filer is reporting for him or herself and continues to hold the phantom stock, we should also report these things on Schedule C Part 2. Uh, and on Schedule C Part 2, we should see the name of the employer, an indication that the arrangement involves phantom stock, the date on which the filer began participating in the plan uh, under which the employee received the phantom stock, the relevant terms of the phantom stock, including the date of any expected payout, and whether or not the employer is likely to make or is going to make future contributions. Uh, so this is like any other Schedule C Part 2 arrangement, um, arrangement residual from uh, past employment. Of course, if the spouse is reporting the phantom stock, uh, Schedule C Part 2 needn't be completed because it applies only to the filer. So what does this mean for our conflicts of interest uh, analysis. 
Uh, here you can see uh, on, on the next slide that there is a ABC company phantom stock reported. Uh, we have the value, we have the specific payment amount, and then an example of how it will be reported on Schedule C. Go ahead and take a moment just to read that. So you can see this looks uh, a lot like uh, continuing participation in, uh, in in employee welfare plans. Uh, you know the way you would report something like a 401k or other incentive package that's uh, continuing. Um, so you can rely on your understanding of those things when we're talking about phantom stock. The real interest and nuance that we will get into is when we get to the conflicts of interest analysis. And like the American depository receipt, we're going to have to be very careful uh, about. Uh, not applying the de minimis exemptions for publicly traded securities. Phantom stock, um, while it says stock, is not a publicly traded security. Uh, the stock does not qualify for the de minimis exemptions under 5 CFR 2640-202. And is that, is that because it doesn't actually create an ownership interest? Um, that's, that's right, Ryan. Uh, Phantom stock doesn't create an ownership interest. It isn't actually an equity interest in the company. It's the right to a payment based on the value of the company. Uh, so this is quite distinct from stock. Uh, likewise, there's no market for these things. You know, they're not traded on an exchange. Uh, they're not registered for the SEC. They're really an agreement for a future payment from the employer to the employee based on the value of the company. So they create an interest in the valuation of the company, and therefore they uh, we have to consider the interest of the company, the employees, for purposes of conflicts of interest. Um, but because they're not publicly traded securities, they're not really securities at all, they don't qualify for the de minimis exemptions for financial interests arising from publicly traded securities. Does that make sense, Ryan? Yes, it does. Excellent. Uh, would you like to take us through margin accounts, uh, and then we'll open it up for some questions? Sure. Since you were talking about two different kinds of two different kinds of uh, stocks, quote unquote stocks, I'll take us through the other kind of account. So the first question uh, that that you might want to want to ask is, what exactly is a margin account? So a margin account is an account with a broker that lets an investor borrow money from that broker to purchase more stock. Usually the purchase the, the securities that are purchased on the margin are held as collateral by the, or, or are the collateral for the uh, for the broker and the filer will pay interest on the on what is essentially a debt to the broker. Now a question you ask is why do people use these? You know, why would you bar borrow money from your broker? Well the reason why is because it allows investors to buy even more uh, stock or bonds than they have money for in their account. So, as an example, let's say that let's say that I have an investment account with a thousand dollars in it, and I think that Facebook or Google stock is going to just go gangbusters tomorrow. And so, I'll tell my broker I would like to put put a thousand dollars into that into into Facebook, and then I would also like to borrow a thousand dollars from you on the margin to purchase even more Facebook stock. And if it turns out that I'm right, and it went very, very well, then not only will I be able to pay off my broker very quickly, but I will also have made uh, made some handy money with it too, because I will have started with a, a larger, uh, a larger investment. So the dis disclosure requirements are the same as for any other commercially available loan. And the terms for this is usually going to be uh, on demand. So what are we looking for on Schedule C Part 1? We want the name of the lender, the type of the liability, which in this case is a margin account. We want to know the date that it was incurred, the interest rate, uh, the, uh, the term. Like I said, it's normally on demand. And the category of the highest aggregate value of the liabilities during the reporting period. So here's a correctly reported one on the next slide. Just take a moment to look at that. Now, oftentimes we, we we've had this question a few times. You know, what about the securities that are purchased uh, on the margin within the margin account? Do we think that these purchases require some kind of extra scrutiny just because they were purchased on the margin? The answer is no. We would examine any securities that are purchased uh, through a margin account exactly the same as any other security. We would check to make sure that there aren't any potential conflicts exactly the same as for any other security. The fact that it was purchased with borrowed money basically doesn't, doesn't make any difference. 
uh, in terms of the potential for conflicts. Now, one other, uh, for, the, for the account itself, uh, as long as, for the conflicts analysis for the account itself, for the commercially available ones, we're going to look at them as the same as any other loan for purposes of conflicts. Now, here's, here's one situation that, that may, uh, may give you pause. What if we have a filer who got special terms from her broker that aren't available to the public? That might be a problem. In that case, 209 would definitely be a concern, and we would need, we would need to uh, begin an analysis process for conflicts in that case. So we'd want to make sure that the margin account or the terms of the margin account aren't being offered or enhanced because of the filer's official position or because of their service to the government. Is that about right? Yes, that's right. Because if you you may remember, uh, Schedule C Part One was originally added in there to make sure that people weren't getting loans disguised as gifts to somehow influence their official actions. I think you meant gifts disguised as loans, Mr. Seagrass. Yes, that is what I meant. <laughs> So uh, now we'd like to open up, uh, open it up for questions. Uh, if we've got uh, any of the folks who are on the on the phone, uh, we also have some questions uh, on uh, Google Plus that we'll be answering. Yeah, it looks like I'd like to start with a question uh, concerning phantom stock, and the question is: Is it the same as a stock option? Um, and the answer is that phantom stock differs from a stock option uh, in a number of important ways. Uh, in both cases, our conflicts analysis is going to basically be the same. They both create an interest in, uh, in the equity of the company and the profitability of the company. So we're going to have what we call a full 18 U.S.C. Section 208 uh, financial interest with the company. So an employee would be prohibited from participating in any particular matter that would have a direct and predictable effect on the financial interest of the company, whether they own options or if they own phantom stock. The way that phantom stock differs from options uh, is that an option provides the right to buy or sell stock uh, at some point in the future. Uh, but the employee then would have to actually make the purchase of the shares at the agreed upon price in the option. In the case of phantom stock, uh, no such thing needs to occur. It's simply a right to a payment at some point in the future that's contingent upon the value of the company. Uh, so again, it's not particularly important for our conflicts analysis. We're still going to have uh, that 208 uh, relationship or uh, prohibition vis-a-vis -vis the company, regardless of whether or not our interest arises from options or from the phantom stock. Uh, neither of those are going to be publicly traded, so we won't have the de minimis exemptions available. Uh, but they are, in fact, uh, different kinds of incentives. But that's a fantastic question. Uh, do we have any questions from the phone? Thank you. At this time, we will begin the question and answer session. To ask a question, please press star 1 on your touchtone phone. Please unmute your phone and record your first and last name clearly when prompted. To withdraw your question, please press star 2. Once again, if you would like to ask a question, please press star 1 and record your first and last name clearly. Our first question comes from Ann Cole. Your line is now open. Hey, Ann. Welcome to the Advanced Hi. Practitioner Series. Thanks for hosting it. Absolutely. Um, I review 450s. Yes. And with things like the ADRs and even the managed accounts, how how does one in reviewing them, I, I hate to say this, but identify them if someone just reports BP? Uh, that, that, that's a good question. Um, you know, in the case of a large company like uh, like BP, uh, you, know, you can go to your preferred financial research site and type in BP, and that site will tell you that it's an ADR. It'll also tell you that it's listed on an exchange, so your conflicts analysis will be as if it was uh, just a publicly traded stock, you know, it's a publicly traded security for our purposes. Um, and you could add, annotate the 450 to add that it's American Depository Receipt. Uh, that's maybe not necessary. What you really want to make sure you do is uh, to ensure that you know whether or not it's publicly traded. Uh, so if you have an asset reported like maybe the Beijing Capital that we looked at before, uh, it can be very tricky to find that, 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 that stock or that ADR. So if you just have Beijing Capital, you might have to go back to the filer and say, you know, what is the specific security you own? You know, could you provide me a ticker symbol so that you can find out if it qualifies for the de minimis exemptions uh, for publicly traded securities? In that case, you'd learn from the ticker symbol 
uh, that it's traded over the counter or on the pink sheet, so therefore not reportable. And for managed accounts, that one, uh, I have not yet run into a situation where uh, a mutual fund and a managed account have the same name. Um, they just have very similar sounding names. So the, the, the big thing for that is to, uh, you know, go to your, uh, go to the internet and, and look it up. And after you've done so, if, if you're looking it up on, on, on Google Finance or Yahoo Finance or whatever service you use and you can't find it, uh, then the thing to do would be to go to that, uh, uh, say it's a, a Fidelity managed account, you would go to Fidelity and see if they offer an account of that name. And in that case, if you see that, then you know that the, the filer is going to have to come back and break out the underlying assets of it. Yes, something I've run into is when you get an incomplete name. Uh, so you might have uh, 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 an entry on a form that just says Fidelity Balanced. And when you go to the website of the financial uh, services provider, you find that there is an managed account by that name and there's also a mutual fund by a very similar name. In those cases, it's very important to go back to the filer to determine exactly which one of those things it is. Does that help? Okay, that, that's super helpful. I mean, that, that will be a lot of work. <laughs> very helpful. <laughs> yeah, it, it, if, if you are inviting your filers to, uh, to file, something that you might note is if they have funds, uh, to make sure that they include that if it is indeed a fund in, in the name. Uh. That, Great advice, and actually encouraging people to include ticker symbols, I think, also would facilitate the review. Yes, absolutely. Yes, it that, would a yes, lot. That dissipates uh, any of the, uh, the the potential confusion there. That's great. Yes. Yeah. Excellent. Well, thanks. Good. Our next question comes from Dan Donahoe. Your line is now open. Hi, Dan. Welcome to the Advanced Practitioner Series. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, I have a quick question about reporting the margin accounts. Uh-huh. And I wanted to use your example for uh, like the purchasing Facebook stock on the margin. Uh -huh. When when reporting that, is the Facebook stock reported on its own on Schedule A, or is the margin account reported like a managed or brokerage account, and the Facebook stock would be an underlying asset of that? Uh, no. So the margin account would would be reported on Schedule C Part One, and the okay. face the Facebook stock would just appear like like any other old stock on Schedule A. Okay. Okay. That's a good question. Thanks, Dan. That's good. Thank you so much. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Once again, if you would like to ask a question, please press star 1 and record your first and last name. Once again, if you would like to ask a question, please press star 1 and record your first and last name clearly. Currently, there are no questions in queue at this time. Great. Well, uh, thank you very much, Melissa, and thank you all on the phone and on the Hangout. Uh, we're going to go ahead and conclude our presentation today. Uh, we appreciate your, your time and uh, participation in our distance learning events, and we hope to see you at future events. Again, I'd like to encourage everyone, um, when you receive the invitations to register for these events, uh, please do so. It provides us a number of opportunities. One, we can make sure you have the right contact information and the materials in a timely way. Uh, it also allows us to keep track of who's uh, been able to attend our training, which is very helpful to us. It also allows us to solicit your feedback and input on future sessions that we should offer. Uh, so I believe uh, Kenesha Cunningham will be sending you a course evaluation if you're on the registration list. Uh, please complete that. Your feedback is extremely helpful to us, and it really does help us plan for future events. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and uh, conclude the broadcast. Uh, thanks for being here today, Ryan, and we'll see you guys all next month. Thank you for your participation in today's conference. You may now disconnect. Leader, please hold for your post-conference.